Peter stood with the other 11 apostles. He raised his voice and he declared, Judeans and everyone living in Jerusalem, know this, listen carefully to my words. Let all Israel know beyond question that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the crowd heard this, they were deeply troubled. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? And Peter replied, Change your hearts and lives. Each of you must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far away as many as the Lord God invites. With many other words, he testified to them and encouraged them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. And those who accepted Peter's message were baptized. God brought about 3,000 people into the community on that day. Please join me in a responsive reading of the Psalter. Today we are reading Psalm 116, selected verses. What can I give back to the Lord for all the good things God has done for me? The death of the Lord's faithful is a costly loss in God's eyes. So I offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving to you, and I'll call on the Lord's name. I'll keep the promises I made to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. Praise the Lord. A reading from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 24, beginning with the 13th verse. On that same day, two disciples were traveling to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And while they were discussing these things, Jesus himself arrived and joined them on their journey and they were prevented from recognizing him. He said to them, what are you talking about as you walk along? And they stopped, their faces downcast, and one named Cleopas replied, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who is unaware of the things that have taken place there over the last few days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, well, the things about Jesus of Nazareth. Because of his powerful deeds and words, he was recognized by God and all the people as a prophet. But our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped that he was the one who would redeem Israel. All these things happened three days ago, but there's more. Some women from our group have left us stunned. They went to the tomb early this morning and didn't find his body. They came to us saying that they'd even seen a vision of angels who told them that he is alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women said. They didn't see him. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, your dull minds keep you from believing all that the prophets talked about. Wasn't it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then he interpreted for them the things written about himself in all the scriptures, starting with Moses and going through all the prophets. When they came to Emmaus, he acted as if he was going on ahead. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us. It's nearly evening, and the day is almost over. And so he went in to stay with them. 
And after he took his seat at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Their eyes were open and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, Weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke to us along the road and when he explained the scriptures for us? They got up right then and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and their companions gathered together. And they were saying to each other, The Lord really has risen. He's appeared to Simon. And then the two disciples described what happened along the road and how Jesus was made known to them as he broke the bread. This, this is, is the, the word, word of the Lord. So once again, we're all going to need to say a little prayer today, since I'm using this iPad and we'll see what happens. <laughs> Loving and gracious God, we thank you for bringing us to this service this day, and we thank you for breaking open your word for us. Help us to hear what it is that you have to say to us. And may we find you on our own Emmaus Road journeys. Amen. So does anyone else this morning think the disciples a bit thick today in the scripture reading? You know what I mean when I say a bit thick, a little dull, a little, a little... <coughs> unaware of circumstances, maybe not too sharp. That's what I mean when I say a bit thick. Two of them are walking along the Emmaus Road when Jesus comes and joins them on their, on their journey, and they cannot recognize him. Now, I always find that part of this story so incredible. You would think that Jesus' own people would recognize him. Those who knew him and, and loved him best. Those who had traveled with him or who, had ate, or who ate with him or maybe even visited with him. The gospel writer does say that these two were disciples. They were people who were part of Jesus' circle of followers. So surely, surely you would think that they would have recognized him the moment that they laid eyes on him. Wouldn't they? I love this Emmaus Road story, but what always puzzles me is that question of why they didn't recognize him at first. I wonder if perhaps maybe it has something to do with Jesus being out of context. And let me explain what I mean by that. Say, for example, that you go grocery shopping and you're shopping up and down the aisles and just when you turn into the snack aisle and you're standing there with your cart in front of the peanut M&Ms and you're debating whether or not you're gonna put that big bag of candy into your cart and another shopper comes down the aisle toward you the opposite direction and suddenly that shopper smiles broadly and, and, and stops to chat with you for a moment Oh, hello, how are you today? It's so good to see you, it's been a while. Oh, tell me, is Jordan graduating this year? How's she doing? And did I hear that Paul retired recently? You smile back and you join in the chatter and the conversation all the time frantically thinking, I know the face, I know the face, but just who is this person? Now, don't eat too many of those, says the shopper, 
as your chat concludes and you're still standing there grinning like a fool as that shopper turns and goes down the next aisle when it finally hits you that that was your dentist. <laughs> But your dentist was out of context. Your dentist was out of context. Without the mask and the rubber gloves and the bright light shining in your face, how would you know that that's who it was? I was in a restaurant a while back in another part of the valley, and I ran into one of our winter residents who hadn't left yet for the summer. And I recognized that person, so I stopped by the table for a moment, and I could tell I could tell for just a split second, there was just this little tiny pause, this moment of hesitation, and then finally, oh, pastor, I didn't recognize you without your robe. <laughs> I was out of context. That must have happened to Cleopas and the other disciple that day they met Jesus traveling on the Emmaus Road. Jesus was out of context. They remembered the crucified Jesus. They remembered the Jesus who died. They remembered the Jesus who was laid to rest in a tomb with a large stone covering the opening to the grave. That was Jesus' context. He was crucified, dead, and buried, as it says in the Apostles' Creed. That was the context for the disciples. They certainly didn't expect to ever see him again, especially on the road to an off-the-beaten-path place like Emmaus. Luke doesn't tell us why the disciples are on their way to Emmaus. We can only suppose that they wanted to get as far away as possible from Jerusalem as they could on foot. They probably sensed that they were in danger if they stayed in Jerusalem. People were already starting to say all kinds of crazy things about Jesus. How his body had gone missing. Pastor Galen reminded us not too long ago that snatching a body in those days was a capital offense. It was probably time for them to get out of town. So they headed off to Emmaus, seven miles out of the way from Jerusalem, where no one would ever think to look for them. Except a stranger. A stranger who joins them on the road and asks them what they are talking about. And they end up telling him all about him. I like how Donovan Drake, a Presbyterian pastor, tells it. He was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, condemned to death, crucified. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. And then they tell the resurrected one about the resurrected one. Some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning. And when they did not find his body there, they came back and they told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And then they tell Jesus, the one they cannot see, about Jesus, the one they did not see. Saying, some of the women who were with us went to the tomb, and some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found that it was just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Do you remember what Pastor Gaylene said to us on Easter Sunday morning about the choice that we must make when we consider the empty tomb? She said something like this, and I'm paraphrasing here. She said, we have two choices. We can understand the empty tomb as the last word, the place where all of our hope ends. Or we can understand it as a declaration of new life from a God who has defeated death for once and for all, a place where hope begins again, a place that creates a new context. 
the context of the risen Lord. With the power to meet each and every one of us in the life context where we find ourselves. All too often, we're like those disciples on the Emmaus Road. We don't recognize Jesus. We don't see him, even when he is right in front of us, offering us every opportunity for new life and for peace and for joy and abundance. Because, well, because we are stuck in our context. We think that life is hopeless we think that there's no way out of our situation, or we think that there are no new possibilities for us. And so we dwell in the negative. The things we say, the things we do, the things we think, we dwell in the negative. We stay stuck in our context, not seeing the new possibilities, not seeing the solutions that God sees for us and holds out to us. We don't trust that God loves us so much more than we can ever, ever know. Enough to offer us an empty tomb. All we see is the empty tomb. And we forget, we have a choice about it. We forget to consider what it means. We forget that we are Easter people and we are not alone. We may not see Jesus or recognize him, but he sees and recognizes us. I'm really leaning Presbyterian this morning. But my favorite Presbyterian preacher, Frederick Buechner, says this. I believe that although the two disciples did not recognize Jesus on the road to Emmaus, Jesus recognized them, and he saw them as if they were the only two people in the world. And I believe that the reason the, why the resurrection is more than just an extraordinary event that took place some 2,000 years ago and then was over and done with is that he also sees each one of us like that. In this dark world where you and I see so little because of our unrecognizing eyes, he whose eye is on the sparrow sees each one of us and I believe that because he sees us, not even in the darkness of death are we lost to him or are we lost to each other. I believe that whether we recognize him or not, or believe in him or not, or even know his name again and again, he comes and walks a little way with us along whatever road we're following. And I believe that through something that happens to us, or something we see, or somebody we know, who can ever guess when, or how, or where, he offers us, the way he did at Emmaus, the bread of life, offers us a new hope, a new vision of light, that not even the dark world can overcome. I love that. We're not just a bit thick, folks. We're just a little out of context. That's all. But Jesus Christ, the resurrected one, recognizes and sees us even in those moments when we can't see what's right in front of us. And he wants us to see this life from his context, from the context of the resurrection. Notice what he does in this story. First, he opens up the scriptures, helping them not simply make sense of recent events in the light of the scriptures, but also to make sense of all the scripture and indeed all of life. 
in the light of God's redemptive work through the cross. And then he shares a meal, lifting up and blessing the bread, breaking it and giving it to them. And then amid these simple and symbolic actions, they recognize him. Through the interpretation of scripture and the sharing of the meal, the eyes of these disciples are opened. They are opened and they recognize not just the person of Jesus, but the presence of the Lord, the God whose powerful word called light from darkness and gives life to the dead. We have some new companions on our journey, some new companions who will take their vows to become members of this church in a few moments. And the other day when we gathered around a table for a meal, I shared with them what it meant to live out those vows of membership. I told them that there were five things that we expected them to do to live out their vows. I told them to pray daily, to pray daily for their church. I told them to pray daily for you and for me and for everyone who is part of this church. And I told them to do that before their feet even touched the floor in the morning. And then I told them to be here, to be here for services, to be here for Holy Communion, for the breaking of bread and the sharing of the cup, unless they're sick or they're out of town. And then I told them to find some way to serve this church, find some way to be of service in the Lord's name, and give a percentage of their income to support the ministries of this church. And then I told them to join a class or a Bible study so that they too could grow in the Holy Spirit and so that they too could be a witness for God's love and God's grace with others who have yet to experience those gifts. I told them that God had blessed them and brought them here for a reason so that we all together could be a stronger, more loving, and even more grace-filled body in Christ. And today, they are making that choice. They are choosing to live life in the context of the resurrection. You see, that's what it means to take the vows of membership seriously in our <coughs> church. It means that we make a conscious choice each and every day to live life in the context of the resurrection. Speaking of what is right in front of us, would you please take out your bulletin right now? Just grab your bulletin, take a look at it. And I want you to take a look at what is on the front cover of the bulletin right underneath the title of the sermon today. And you will find today's scriptures and then you will find a prayer. We've been doing that for years here at Shepherd of the Hills. We've been putting the scriptures and the prayer for the week on the front cover of the bulletin and they are there for a reason, my friends. Our church has always been intentional about those scriptures and about those prayers. They are tools for living our lives in the context of the resurrection. And we publish them every week so that we can all spend our time reading those scriptures, thinking about them throughout the week, and praying that daily prayer, not just for ourselves, but for others in our church. They are tools, and they are right in front of us to live each day in the hope and the power that Jesus offers us, hope for a new future, and the power, the power to change the context of life in which we find ourselves. Remember the rest of this story? It says that after Jesus broke open the scriptures and he broke open the bread for the disciples, after they recognized him, they jumped up and they went right back to Jerusalem. They weren't afraid anymore. Their context had changed and they had hope. 
And they had the power to live in joy. We may not always see Jesus standing right in front of us. We may not always recognize him walking along with us, along the Emmaus Road. But I promise you, he is there, walking alongside of us, sometimes even a little out ahead of us, inviting us to follow, inviting us not to be afraid, inviting us that no matter what our future holds, we will not be alone. He will be with us. And so we can live, live in hope and live in joy and live in the context of the resurrection. Amen.